We've all heard it before. It's who you know. Welcome to Social Capital, a weekly podcast that dives into social relationships and why the investment you put into them is so important. Your host, Lori Hybe, will connect with industry-leading professionals and dive into their networking experiences and expert advice. Hi, I'm Lori Hybe, CEO and founder of Keystone Click and the host of Social Capital Podcast. And today with me is Abby Radawan. Uh, did I say that right? Okay. That's my time. Yes, Scott. Okay. Abby Radawan, she is the digital content manager at Keystone Click, and she's going to interview me for the 400th episode of Social Capital. Thanks for having me, Lauren. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm excited for this. Yeah, we get to put you in the hot seat. Yeah, it's fun. All right, so let's start off um, with you just telling us a little bit about your background. How far back do you want me to go? Um, as far back as you think is interesting, tell us where you grew up. Anything interesting that happened? Okay. Anything that led you to where you are today? Yeah, so I grew up in a Chicago suburb called Streamwood, Illinois. Um, I played a lot of softball there, and I remember actually right at the end of our block was a bunch of baseball and softball diamonds, and in the summer we played a lot of like sandlap baseball, and that was just like one of my favorite memories of childhood. Um, but my family moved up to um, Wisconsin um, in my um, high school years, and I still played travel softball and high school softball then. Um, and I exhausted all of the art classes that were available in my high school, so much so that I ended up doing a really cool program at the Milwaukee Art Museum called Art Satellite, where for half a day in an entire semester, I was at the art museum, to, you know, learning art history, doing art projects. And um, it was with students like all around the Milwaukee area that had done, um, exhausted their art programs as well. Got my associates in marketing, my bachelor's in marketing, and ultimately my master's in business administration. It's very interesting. Before you took that sociology class, what was your plan for your career path? Um, I worked at a web development company and I thought I would be designing websites. Have you carried any of those art skills over into what you do day to day now as a CEO and founder? I would, I would ask you if you see that happening. <laughs> um, and I would say I'm not as good as like the tactical implementation of the digital art world right now, but I understand the theory of design and I understand the principle and I can tell you what's good design and what's not good design. Um, from a creative perspective, though, I love drawing and painting, so I try to do that in my free time when it allows. Yeah. I've seen your house covered in your paintings. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So for people who know you well, they know that sports are a really big part of your life, uh -huh. um, especially hockey. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about softball growing up. Tell us why you're so passionate about sports and how they've shaped who you are today. Yeah. Great question. So growing up, yeah, sports was a big part of our life. My dad was the big factor in that he he played a lot of sports, he coached, he refed. I mean, his whole life was hockey. So growing up, um, most of our family vacations were actually hockey tournaments for the kids that he was coaching at the time, um, which was a lot of fun. But we he instilled in us and kind of treated us like a team, you know, so we were always, you know, training and um, learning about communication. I mean, even to the extent of like, his punishment for us was doing push-ups when we were at home. So, you know, we learned a lot about, um, we just learned a lot about working together as a team. And I think that's really important, something that I carry over. From a professional standpoint, you know, sports, team sports in particular, and even individual sports, but that's a longer tangent. Team sports is a lot about communication. And teams that don't communicate well have issues. Um, and that's one of the things, and you've heard me say this, we over communicate. I don't care if you think everyone knows the answer, you still communicate the answer. Um, even in playing hockey, I mean, communication on the ice is critical because you want to be able to hear that your teammate is behind you. You may not be able to see them, but if they vocalize that they're around you, it makes it easier to anticipate what the play is going to be going for in pick clock. So getting back to your early career, um, tell us about your first job out of college. I'd love to hear a story of something you learned, maybe something that went wrong that is a lesson that you still carry with you today. 
So I was a non-traditional student. I Right out of high school, I started working full-time at a web development company, but I was going to school nights and weekends. Um, so, um, but a story and a lesson that I learned um, was at a second, a different advertising agency I was working at. Um, and it was a very expensive mistake, but I was in charge of purchasing print for um, on behalf of our clients. And I would typically get quotes, so kind of like a print broker, get quotes from a number of different printers, um, and then find, like, you know, the most bang for the buck. We'd put our, you know, markup on it for managing the project and the design. Um, well, I ended up um, giving the client one estimate and then going with a different vendor, um, not realizing that they were the... The pricing was not right. At the end of the day, we ended up paying more money than the client had paid us for the print work. So... Um, I learned a lesson, the owners learned a lesson about, you know, paying a little bit closer attention to what I was doing. Um, but yeah, it's all about paying attention to the details. So what do you, what are those important details that you, um, try not to miss and try to make sure that, um, your team doesn't miss today? There's a lot. (laughs) There's, um, yeah. Details are really making, it, it comes down to making sure that, there's no assumptions and that um, you, you're you anticipating potential risks that could happen and trying to get in front of them, um, whether it's um, a timeline plan, um, a messaging plan. Um, it's all about making sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And, and so that's a really broad statement, but there's It's, um, I'm a big believer in doing the ordinary things extraordinarily well, and that's what's going to set you apart from those that are good versus those are great. So from that first um, job in an advertising agency, you said you were kind of a print broker a little bit. How did you get from there to here, the CEO on Bonner? Sure. So my first job out of high school was at a web development company. And then I went to the traditional shop. Um, so I, it was 2008, um, and I wasn't super in love with what it was that I was doing. We were very much traditional, and the web was kind of becoming super hot and sexy. And the folks that were running the agency were kind of like ready to just ride the train to retirement. Um, no judgment, guys. But um, they weren't really interested in jumping into the digital space at all. So I decided to kind of take the leap and start something on my own. And that's when I started building websites on my own. I got my first three clients by doing snail mail. I literally mailed a letter to every single person on the planet that I have contact information to. And I did an email to every single email address I had. That's how I got my first three clients. And here we are today. <laughs> what did you love so much about your position and the industry that made you feel like you had the passion to be able to start a business? I will admittedly say that I was ignorant and cocky and thought that I could do it better than the other people that were doing it. <laughs> um, but no, I, I'm extremely, like I said, that sociology class, I was fascinated by the concept of how um, culture, community, messaging, branding, positioning influences people. Mm. Um, And I think that there's a lot of people that use that power for the wrong reasons. And I'm a big believer in conveying, you know, the truth and doing the things right the right way. So um, that's kind of the approach that I took with that. Yeah. Where do you think, um, I think it's no secret that doing things the right way can sometimes lead to a longer, maybe more difficult along the way Mm -hmm. journey. Have you felt that or have you felt it paid off pretty quickly? Uh, It's definitely been a longer journey. And I don't always choose the right path. I make a decision and move forward and I then realize that was a valuable lesson that I learned and make an adjustment. Um. But at the end of the day, I believe that, you know, reputation is critical. I mean, social capital is all about networking and relationships. And, um, you know, once you lose the trust of someone, 
that it's not just that person, but you don't know who else they're talking to, who else they're connected to. Um, so I always do my best to function in doing what I believe is 100% the right path to pursue. Yeah. In order to make decisions and run with them and then be able to evaluate whether they've been good or bad along the way, you have to be pretty confident and pretty introspective. What do you do in your personal life that kind of bolsters those? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I do put a lot of, I try to focus on me a lot. Um, I meditate a lot. I practice gratitude every single day. Um, and I read a lot of self-help books, I call them, but you know, just like how to be a better leader and, you know, just how to negotiate and how to eat better, just kind of books to better me. Um, but I also have just learned over time that, you know, the, the lack of making a decision impedes progress. So if you want to see any sort of progress, you have to make a decision and, and not question it. You have to start moving forward. You can always stop and make adjustments to the decision, but not making a decision at all, you're still in the same spot you were at that point in time. How do you stay motivated to keep, <laughs> keep attacking those decisions rather than kind of tiptoeing down the middle of the path, not choosing a direction? Sure. Um, it, it's exhausting. I will admit that. Um, that's why when I go home and my husband says, what do you want for dinner? I say, I don't care. I'm done making decisions today. Um, it, it, it's um, knowing what the end goal is. You know, there's there's a big shiny carrot that I'm working towards for me personally, my personal life. Um, and the business is a big component and element of that, right? We all have personal goals and we're working on some level uh, to achieve them. So um, yeah, just being confident in the decision making to move forward is going to keep practice moving forward. So you mentioned that you work hard to focus on yourself mm -hmm. in order to kind of keep everything else afloat and keep everything else running smoothly. Is that something that you knew right away going into your founder journey or is it something that you had to learn along the way? <laughs> Hello is the answer to that. Um, no, I, the whole entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. You know, you can you build a business plan and you should build a business plan, but it is never going to go exactly the way it is. Now, COVID is a perfect example of that, among many other things that disrupt the plan that you build. Um, but one of the biggest things that I learned while running a business is that my attitude and how I show up every day to the team is what permeates across the rest of the team. So if I come in crabby and unmotivated, that is going to just seep into everyone else's vibes. If I come in excited, energetic, and want to um, get shit done, that's how everyone else is going to feel. So it's I learned I have to take care of myself so that I can show up every single day to keep everyone else energized. Kind of like on a team. Yeah, exactly. And when you play team sports, you always, you want that cheerleader. Mm -hmm. You know, I notice when I play hockey, if I have the puck and I hear someone, go Lori, go, like that motivates me, right? So you always kind of need that cheerleader to get everyone else motivated. And um, as the owner, I'm the cheerleader. I will say, in my experience coaching volleyball, and which you know, volleyball is really, really a team sport where you can't really hog the ball it's kind of impossible to hog the ball and I will say one person with a bad attitude can ruin a whole match for the whole team yeah they really drag everybody down so we appreciate that you show up as your best oh thanks are there any other business owners or business leaders large or small that inspire you um, there's lots of business owners that inspire me um Drew McClellan from Agency Management Institute. You you guys here, we talk a lot about him and his philosophies with business. I'm really impressed with what he's done. And he's um, he's got a philosophy of leading with love and giving and being honest and integrity and everything that he does. And you know, I just really try to mirror his business philosophies and what he's doing. And he's a really cool guy. And I'm on 
All right. So we're talking about how Keystone Click got started. Tell me what the vision was. Like, what was that kind of pie in the sky that you saw down the road at that time? And then maybe we'll talk about if it's the same now or not. <laughs> I wanted to be the best web development company that's out there. I mean, that was a really loose, young, ignorant Lori thought without any bigger picture plans than that. I knew what I enjoyed doing and I just wanted to be the best one out there. And we do way more than web development now. We sure do. Yeah, because when we started, that's all we were doing. Um, I wasn't even hosting websites at the time. So, um, yeah, and it's just the evolution of the industry and um, digital in general has changed so much that um, is someone that really believes in doing what's best for the client is how we've really evolved. So um, before I started the agency, I was doing... PPC, SEO, and email marketing for um, other com another company. And um, those were acronyms that people didn't really know at the time, first off. So I knew how to do all of those things, but I just found that, you know, building websites was kind of the sweet spot initially. Uh, but folks would come to me and say, hey, what's this Facebook and should I be on it? And how do I do this for my business? Or you built this site and how do I show up at Google? And I would just tell them what to do. And well, can you do it for me? Like, hello, light bulb. So that's kind of how we evolved to be more of a, um, you know, full digital um, agency. Yeah. What do you think is, since you founded the company, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned? <laughs> um, to not try to do everything myself. When I did get started, um, I was trying to, I would just go to Google to find template contracts. And I was trying to do all of the financials by myself. I bought QuickBooks. I had no freaking clue how to use it. Um, so every weekend after working all week long, I was trying to figure out the numbers and how to use the system and how to plug in invoices and get paid and pay my vendors. Um, and just racking my head against that. Um, and then eventually I realized like, oh, there's people that do this and this is what their business is. So um, yeah, the first kind of person I outsourced work to was a, a bookkeeper. Um, and that just was huge. You know, granted, I was understanding that I have to pay for their services, um, but it saved me a ton of time. I got my weekends back, you know, fr from that perspective. And um yeah, and then I hired an attorney and to help with the contracts and create all of the baseline contracts for us to make sure they're protecting us the right way, right? Um, and so, yeah, I've got an accountant who handles, you know, the, the taxes and whatnot. So I've got a business coach. Again, I don't have all the answers, so it's it makes sense to not try to spread yourself too thin, but to really just focus on your zone of genius. Yeah. I know a social capital's audience is a lot of other business owners and founders, mm -hmm. but I'd imagine there's certainly a good number of people as well who might be in that position you were in several years ago where they're, they're working in an industry they really love, but they don't maybe love exactly where they're working or they feel like they can't, they have something unique to offer that they can't offer right now that are thinking about starting a business. What would be your advice to them? First and foremost, find someone that's already done that. Find someone that's five years ahead of where you want to be um, and try to build a mentorship relationship with them. Ask them all the questions, how they got started, what mistakes did they make? Um, would you be interested in mentoring me? Can I continue? Can you help me in any way or connections that you can make with me, for me? Um, yeah, I, that mentorship is extremely powerful and having... Um, someone to bounce ideas off of, even if you're stuck in a decision um, to just talk through it is extremely helpful. And I'd say more times than not, especially in that small business entrepreneurship world, people are going to say yes, because they've more than likely had someone else that they could kind of lean into and um, good people are going to want to pay it forward. Since social capital is about networking primarily, do you have any advice for people that are looking for a mentor and how they could go about finding that right person? Sure. So sometimes it just happens organically. Um, other times I would say just find someone again that um, 
that you've been looking up to or you find um, inspiring as a thought leader perspective um, and ask them. It doesn't hurt to ask, honestly, that, again, more times than not, they're going to say yes to that relationship. And also, what are the what does the no cost you? Yeah, yeah, you don't know until you try. Right, exactly. I love that. How has networking changed the way that you do business here? Networking is a critical part of business. Building relationships, building trust. Um, it was extremely challenging when all networking went virtual um, because you know people are sidetracked. They're looking at their email while they're on a Zoom call. Um, but there's something different about sitting across from someone or attending an event together and the, the body chemistry and, you know, you, you realize like, oh, we do get along. Well, this is really, um, there's something here. I'm interested in having, you know, a deeper conversation. So just that building those relationships and establishing trust are, are critical. And, um, I think I, I, I've shared this numerous times on the podcast, but after interviewing, you know, close to 400 people on the topic of networking, I kind of created my my three golden rules of networking. First and foremost, um, be authentic because people can smell through fake real quick and they don't want to be around fake. Um, and you're going to attract your like-minded individuals if you're just being your true self. Um, two is to give first. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything super big or fancy, just, you know, a, a, a book. You know, if someone mentioned a book or I recommended a book, give a book. If someone mentioned a favorite restaurant they like to go to, if someone says I'm looking for a dog sitter and I've got a friend who dates its dogs, I make a connection. Just give something first. And the third thing is to follow through. If you did make a commitment, you have to make sure you do that. If you don't follow through on that commitment that you made, you're automatically leaving a bad taste in that person's mouth and you're um, destroying the trust. Can you tell us about an early networking experience that maybe led you to learn one of those lessons? Let me to learn one of those lessons. Um, the I the first networking experience I had came to mind. I don't know if one of those lessons was incorporated into that, but I when I was working at the web development company, um, they had won some awards for their work, and um, no one really wanted to go to the award show. And I was like, I'll go. That sounds cool. And you know, there was a bunch of people sitting at a table, eating, shaking hands, drinking. I'm like, this is fun. Why don't I do? How come no one ever told me about this before? Um, and then I actually ended up getting a prospective client for the agency just because I was being Lori. <laughs> um, you know, they were interested in having a deeper conversation, and um, and that's where I'm like, oh, this okay, this is what networking is. I thought it was gonna be like super scary, but it's just about building relationships. Do you think those fears about networking before you went into it are unique to you? Or do you think that's something that is kind of pervasive? I think everyone is afraid of it on some level. I mean, especially introverts. Walking in a room with, with a bunch of people you don't know is extremely scary and intimidating. Um, for the longest time, I would have a networking buddy. So we'd like go in together. And um, I actually find that to be extremely beneficial because you go in it just eliminates a little bit of that fear and reservation. And then when we get comfortable, we kind of divide and conquer the room so that, you know, I know what that person's looking for. That person knows what I'm looking for. So if I meet someone, not only am I talking about myself, but I'm also talking about the other person that's in the room and I can make a direct connection to them as well. What do you think that people with established networks like yourself can do to kind of lower the barrier to entry and lower those fears for people before, for younger people before they come in and start, get started on their networking journey. Sure. Well, listen to all 399 episodes of the podcast because I talk a lot about that. <laughs> um, but um, I would say, yeah, finding, um, finding a buddy, buddy system is good. Finding a mentor is good. Oftentimes I would um, attend an event with a mentor that I had at the time and they would start making introductions um, or going in with a different mindset of not, I'm, I'm not trying to make new relationships, but I'm like, I'm writing a paper for school, you know, like you're, you're kind of going in playing tricks with your mind a little bit. That can be helpful. Um, and start small, just reaching out and asking for, 
So I'm, hey, I've got a couple of questions. I'm interested in this career path. You know, again, most people are going to say yes and want to be helpful <laughs> as opposed to ignoring you. Yeah. This is maybe a little bit tangential, but what is the, the best trick that you've learned to play on your mind? <laughs> um, oh, I guess it's been a while since I've done that. I, you know, I just... I just show up and be Lori. I used to have a lot of um, reservations and fears around attending events, but I, I've learned to just be comfortable with me and who I am and the right type of people will come and talk to me. Yeah. So I just be me and the right people come talk to me <laughs> or they send people to me. Um, yeah, I just go be your authentic self and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Show genuine interest in someone too. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to your 20-year-old self, what would you tell yourself to do more of or less of or differently in your career um, professionally? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's two things. One, I wish I would have um, spent or found a way to stay closer connected to the professors that I had when I was in school. LinkedIn wasn't a thing back then. So, um, there, you know, I had like their phone number probably on the syllabus, which I'm sure is long gone, like that was probably the only way I could have connected. I remember that, like you would actually call them, which no one probably even does that anymore, to tell them like, I won't be in class next week <laughs> or whatever. Um, but I had some amazing professors, so I really do wish that I uh, was more intentional about staying in touch with them. Um, but I also would have found a mentor sooner, actually, um, to help guide me, especially on the not just the entrepreneurial path, but really the career path that I took because I was really making those decisions on my own and didn't have someone really like guiding me professionally, like saying you should go to a networking group or this is the group you should go to or this is the company you should, you know, work with. So I wish I had. Do you think in the industry right now, there's a lot of talk about LinkedIn maybe being a little bit less valuable than it was at its inception because there's a lot of selling happening on LinkedIn. It's just so, so, so saturated. Do you think, do you find that to be true? And if so, what would be your remedy? I think there's still, I mean, social media, especially on the B2B side, the intention is to ultimately get some sort of a relationship that's happening with most likely the goal being a sale of some sort, right? Or just nurturing that relationship. I do see aggressive sales happening more on like the DM side of things, um, which is annoying, but I also appreciate that people are, you know, giving it a try and boots to the ground and, and people are working hard right now because times aren't easy for a lot of companies. Um, there's also a lot of really amazing content, though, like thought leadership content on LinkedIn. And, and I love reading some of the inspiring content that's out there and educational content. Um, I don't devalue it. The network that I have, even though I'm not 100 percent like this type of relationship with everyone I'm connected with. When I do need to tap into my network or find someone, I, it is great to see that who I'm connected with. And that's where I start that conversation. Um even if, and I always share with anyone that I, from a networking perspective, if there's someone I can connect you with that's on my LinkedIn, let me know because that one-to-one -one connection is going to go a lot smoother than someone blindly reaching out. So even though I may not have that trusted relationship with them yet, at least I have uh, a smoother in because I have a connection with them. Sure, sure. That's really smart. Well, Lori, I will always love when I get to the opportunity to do something like this with you because I feel like I always learn something new about you personally and more about your professional journey. I feel like I take a lot of nuggets away from it. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom for your dedicated social capital audience before we wrap up? Oh, well, I didn't even think about this one. Um, I would say... Ha Know what your end game is um, and build the roadmap to get there. One of my favorite books is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And my favorite habit is Start With Me End In Mind. I love that. Thanks so much for listening in for 400 episodes. This was a super fun episode to record. I really appreciate you. Let's connect if we haven't already. Go out there and get noticed. 
That's all for this episode of the Social Capital Podcast. Visit socialcapitalpodcast.com for show notes, more episodes, and to see who will be on the show next. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next episode.